The epilogue begins on page 309. Three months have passed since we cremated John Lake's body and scattered the ashes in the woods near our boyhood home. I must admit that at first I had great difficulty accepting John's suicide. I said that it was a cop-out and not worthy of his macro philosophy. However, as the weeks have passed, Nada has chipped away at my micro philosophy until today I see John's actions in a very different light. Perhaps the most important factor altering my viewpoint was a conversation we had with John a few nights before he left us. John didn't include it in his journal, and I wish he had because it would have reminded me of the macro society's view of life and death. Between Nada and myself, we have recalled most of the details of that conversation. As we remember it, it began one evening when I remarked about a student in our department who had just committed suicide. I said that suicide was a cop-out, and John had replied with the following. You're complaining, Carl, about a conscious act of suicide which may or may not be an attempt to deny one's own responsibility for his present state of being. Aren't you forgetting that all micro-existence is unconscious suicide? It may end swiftly, as with a lethal accident, or it may be a slow process of micro-aging which results in the long-term decay and deterioration of the body until some vital part fails completely. All of this deterioration is the natural result of resisting the responsibility and the consequences of one's own chosen life pattern. This resistance causes all the life stress that Dr. Hans Selye refers to in his book, The Stress of Life. All right, I said, I won't argue unconscious suicide or Dr. Selye's stress theory. But the student we're talking about committed suicide, conscious suicide, since he left a note apologizing to his parents. Now I say that's a coward's way out. John gave me his big grin and said, according to that French psychologist we studied, Emile Durkheim, there are two types of suicide, anomic and altruistic. The first, anomic, is due to self-other alienation and is an attempt to escape from a life so overwhelming that the person perceives himself as being completely inadequate to cope with it. This is what I call conscious micro-suicide. It is always unsatisfactory to the micro-self, because when the person wakes up in his astral body, he finds that he is still stuck with a mind that believes it's not responsible, a mind filled with the kind of unforgiving self-loathing that the micro-self experiences when faced with failure. At this point, Nada interrupted, asking, But John, didn't you say that all actions are perfect from a macro-view? How can suicide be perfect? At the macro-level, he answered, Every negative action is balanced by positive action, and thus they cancel each other, leaving perfect balance. From the macro view, one can see that every failure is a success in the long run because it leads to the insight necessary for learning. If a soul has to commit micro-suicide once or a thousand times in order to learn that there is no escape from one's own responsibility for its state of being, then it is necessary and perfect for that soul. I see, Nada said, nodding her head. Then, what is altruistic suicide? Well, a good example of that kind, John explained, was demonstrated when the Titanic sank. Some of the people aboard went down with the ship rather than deprive someone else of a seat in the very limited number of lifeboats. History is filled with such examples of altruistic suicide in which people consciously gave up their lives so others could live or profit from their example. Suicide as an example? Nada hesitated. Is that what the members of the macro society are doing when they permit the micro-islanders to kill them? Maybe they're trying to show by their example that physical life is not the ultimate goal. Well, that's part of it, John responded. The most famous example of this was the suicide of one of the greatest macro-philosophers ever to be incarnated on this planet, Jesus of Nazareth. He permitted himself to be killed to demonstrate that the macro-self is the master of the micro-physical self and that it can recreate or resurrect a body that has been killed. I think he was also demonstrating his belief that physical existence, while necessary for microman, is only one very limited perspective along the MM continuum. So the evolutionary goal, Nate added, is to not get stuck forever at the microphysical level, but to journey onward toward ever greater awareness until each soul returns to full awareness of its macrocosmic origin. That's right, John said. And that leads us to a third type of suicide that microman is not yet aware of evolutionary suicide, what the macro society calls evolation. I think you mentioned that before, John, I said. Yes, you'll remember that when I was in the hospital trying to save lives, I was thwarted by some of the patients whose subconscious minds had decided on death. Remember Bruno, 
who told me that he had incarnated to balance his vibrations, and now that he had accomplished his purpose, he was graduating from this life and evolving into a new dimension. You may also recall that our Deltar, Hugo, also planned to consciously terminate his physical existence, to evolate. No one dies until he's convinced at the macro or subconscious level that he has learned all he can or all he wants to in a particular life. This applies just as much to the baffling problem of crib deaths as to the deaths due to cataclysmic earthquakes or tidal waves. Are you saying that the subconscious mind knows what will happen in the future and could avoid an accident if it so desired? Ada asked. That's exactly what I'm saying, John nodded enthusiastically. From the macro view, there are no accidents. But getting back to evolutionary suicide, I said, isn't that as big a cop-out as anomic suicide? I mean, if you've learned your lessons, you don't have to stick around and help those who haven't. That's like saying that everybody should stay in first grade forever so they can help teach the lessons there, John replied. Someone's got to teach first grade, I protested. There has never in the history of our universe been a shortage of teachers, only of students willing to learn. As the macro philosophers have said, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Ask and you will receive is another way of stating the same macro truth. It reflects back to prepotent desire and predisposing belief. If you desire something more than learning, or if you don't believe that you can learn, or that you deserve to learn, you'll have to wait until your desire and belief are greater before you succeed, John explained. I still don't see how you could tell the difference between a cop-out suicide and evolutionary suicide, I said, shaking my head. What's well, a question of motive, Carl? John explained. Was the motive for death to escape the past or to embrace the future? A cop-out suicide is escaping his past or present. An evolutionary suicide is embracing his future. Well, that's a hard one to handle, I complained. Wouldn't a person tend to lie to himself about his desire to escape life? Sure, that happens a lot, John answered. But in each life, there are lessons that must be learned. But if you lie to yourself about having learned all there is to learn in first grade, then commit suicide, you wake up right back in first grade. You see, in this planetary schoolroom, it's impossible to be a dropout for very long. You can't run away from your own greater self. Microman views physical life on this planet as the final stage, rather than just a preparation for experiencing the next dimension. With that sort of philosophy, he naturally tends to think that suicide would end it all. He becomes the victim of his own microbe philosophy. Well, then, is suicide a sin or not? Nada asked. Well, it's hard to generalize about suicide, Nada, since all death is either conscious or unconscious suicide, John replied thoughtfully. As for sin, there's only one sin, and that is to deny the perfection of our macrocosmic oneness with all that is, was, or ever will be. But even that is only a sin from the micro view. From the macro view, there can be no sin, for all is purposively and evolutionarily perfect. The key, then, is to accept the perfection of what is by responding to everything with a loving acceptance, thereby freeing yourself from the bonds of anxiety, fear, and condemnation which bind you to physical existence. Then and only then is evolution possible. Okay, if I was macro, I would know who was living by the rule of loving acceptance and who wasn't, and I'd know everyone's motives for ending their life. Then I'd be able to tell if it was suicide, as we popularly think of it, or evolution. Problem is, I'm not macro. I protested, so I don't know how to tell the difference. Remember that monograph we read back in cultural anthropology? The one on that Indian tribe whose old people, when they were ready to die, just said goodbye to everyone, went up on a hill, and died, John asked. Yeah, kind of like your Hugo's plan to, I began. That's it exactly, Carl, John interrupted. If you use anything to do the job with, you committed the escape of suicide. If you wrapped up the details of your life, then just laid down and died, that's evilation. Now that's as close as Nada and I could come to a total recall of that evening's conversation. It was John's comments on evilation combined with our dreams of him that ultimately modified my view of John's death by broadening my perspective. I still miss John terribly, but Nada reminds me that nothing is terrible from a macro viewpoint, so I know what level I'm at. However, I can remember John saying that our level of awareness is constantly fluctuating, and that in one 24-hour period, an average micro-person like myself can run the gamut of micro-awareness from low-level micro to high-level macro-awareness, the latter occurring mostly when you're asleep and dreaming. I'll end this epilogue with such a dream. It was the last of a series of dreams I've had about John. In most of them, we just talked in our usual manner, but this one was different. 
we know that it was symbolic because john had told us that 2150 has neither graves nor tombstones since discarded physical bodies are vaporized in this dream nada and i were standing with john before a great tombstone upon which were engraved the following words died john and carol and under john is eight dash nine two seven under carol is three dash nine two seven members of delta nine two seven of the macro society and under john is nineteen seventy six under carol is twenty one fifty on the lower portion of the tombstone is engraved reborn john and carol with the numbers this time nine nine two seven and four nine two seven members of delta nine two seven of the macro society twenty one fifty